The Unshackled Waves, episode 264. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Last year, the world gained another bombastic populist and nationalist world leader who sent the political elites into another tailspin. In Brazil's 2018 presidential election, Jair Bolsonaro, a well-known political maverick, he beat 11 other candidates, breaking the center-left's grip on the nation's politics. Bolsonaro was labeled a fascist by the left and the international media, but in Brazil, he has introduced free market reforms, reducing the size of government, rolling back the influence of cultural markets Marxism on the nation and empowering individual Brazilians. While Bolsonaro was in attendance at the G7 summit last month in France, he copped a serve from French President Emmanuel Macron due to the annual wildfires in the Amazon rainforest. Macron said this was a global environmental issue as the Amazon was the lungs of the world. Bolsonaro rebuffed any foreign interference over Brazil's sovereignty over the Amazon, calling it colonialism and imperialism. The Western media in response posted endless hysterical fake news stories claiming that the Amazon was going to be completely destroyed and that Bolsonaro was basically an environmental criminal. Brazil, being a Latin American nation which Portuguese as its local language, it is very difficult for those in the West to know the real story about Bolsonaro's revolution in Brazil and how he is transforming the nation. Well, thankfully, I know someone who can tell the real story about Brazil's new beginning. Professor Augusto Zimmerman, who has been a guest on this show before, he was born and grew up in Brazil, but he's most known in Australia for his distinguished uh, legal academic career. He's currently a professor and dean of law at Sheridan College, a Christian liberal arts college in Perth, Western Australia. He is also an adjacent professor of law at the University of Notre Dame's Sydney campus, a Catholic university. Professor Zimmerman has has previously been a Law Reform Commissioner with the Law Reform Commission of Western Australia and a former Associate Dean and Postgraduate Research Director at Murdoch's University School of Law. Professor Zimmerman is also the founder and president of the West Australian Legal Theory Association. He's also a former Vice President of the Australian Society of Legal Philosophy, a fellow at the International Academy for the Study of the Jurisprudence of the Family and he's also editor-in-chief of the Western Australian uh, Juris Law Journal. He is a regular columnist in the Australian media, in the Spectator Australia, Quadrant Online, and News Weekly, as well as right here on The Unshackled. He has also authored four academic books, including No Offence Intended, Why 18C is Wrong, along with uh, Joshua Forrester and Lorraine Finlay, uh, plus three volumes of Christian Foundations of the Common Law, all published by Conacourt Publishing. He has always been a great friend of ours, so it's great to have him back on the show today to discuss this very important important uh, global political story. Augusto, welcome back to the show. It's a great pleasure to be back to, with you again. Now, as your uh, surname uh, Zimmerman uh, suggests, it's, uh, it's a Hispanic uh, name. Uh, you're Brazilian uh, born, but most of your commentary is very much focused on Australian politics and legal issues. You're very much an Australian now, but as a native uh, Brazilian, you still have plenty to say about the political revolution happening there, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think our audience and me personally would like to know about your time in Brazil, what everyday life was like, and of course, uh, why you chose to emigrate. Well, I was an academic in my uh, native country, uh, already an academic. I was a professor of constitutional law in one of the universities in Rio de Janeiro and I uh, was very uh, disappointed with the reaction of my peers when uh, we had that terrible tragedy, that terrible tragedy that took place in New York. And I have just realized, I had realized then that um, my worldview uh, was very different from the worldview of my fellow academics who uh, took delight in blaming the victim for what happened on that terrible uh, occasion. 
So I decided that it would be better for me to leave the country because I had lost my hope for the country since the politics in Brazil seemed to be completely hijacked by the extreme left which has uh, been uh, controlling the country for about 20 years or more. I would say that ever since the military relinquished power, Brazil has been dreadfully, dreadfully ruled by a very corrupt left-wing regime. 2001, uh, what you're referring to, the 9-11 the attacks, uh, in the, the decade after that, it was well noted in the news that Latin American politics had, had moved to the left. That's when a lot of the mainstream media thought Hugo Chavez, he was the new poster boy for, for socialism. There was Bolivia and, and Chile elected socialist uh, leaders. And yeah, it's quite, quite sad that you felt the, the need that there was, there was no hope there and it's it's been well documented over the years of uh, brazil's uh, decline there's been a lot of corruption in government and, and this is after the nation uh, returned to democracy in 1985 uh, the the world cup in in 2014 and the olympic games in 2016 were meant to showcase brazil to the world but the locals did not want it just because of the extravagance and yeah. all the money that was being uh, siphoned off and uh, a lot of brazilian cities are noted for their their crime and and poverty so definitely the stage was set for brazilians to seek some sort of political savior yes Indeed, but uh, in many ways, uh, Lula, the previous president, was a populist leader, a very corrupt uh, left-wing charismatic leader who was uh, engaged in very incestuous relationships with very uh, dangerous and corrupt and even evil, I would say, regimes all over the world, including Iran, including uh, uh, Syria, and including Libya, uh, one of uh, the former president's uh, best friend was Mohammed Gaddafi. Uh, that uh, Mohammed Gaddafi or something like that, that, that dictator uh, in Libya. And he was um, also uh, having very strange connections with the government of the Ayatollahs in Iran. So even to the point of organizing uh, criminal organizations uh, all over the world to destabilize democracies. He was the founder of the notorious Sao Paulo Forum, which uh, congregated the worst characters in the world, uh, guerrilla lords, narco-traffic guerrilla lords, uh, le very radical left-wing regimes. They were assembled in this organization with the purpose of destabilizing democratic regimes all over the world. Uh, Brazil, during the uh, Workers' Party regime, was uh, financially sponsoring Cuba and Venezuela and many other uh, tyrannical regimes that have undermined the basic rights of the people in these countries. And of course, the left media, left-wing media, the mainstream media was completely silent about this um, uh, promotion of uh, gross violations of human rights by this uh, extremely corrupt and evil uh, government that Brazilians had until quite recently. Yes, this is the first time I've heard about that. And Brazil, it's, it's not a, a small country. It's, uh, despite its problems, it's an economic powerhouse. And so it's a world superpower that doesn't get the, the same scrutiny that a place like the United States or the United Kingdom does. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's a very strange thing that the media was silent about all these violations of human rights. And also the fact that the Workers' Party employed thousands and thousands of uh, their supporters, bas basically establishing a one-party system in the country, whereby if you work uh, for the government and you belong to the Workers' Party, the governing party, you would be forced to give about 10% of your salary to this uh, political machine. Another thing that uh, uh, led to the election of Bolsonaro 
is the fact that there is no equality before the law in Brazil, whereby I would say the elite has a different sort of uh, rules to be applied to uh, these privileged individuals. Uh, they are retired in a different, under a different model, where they can sometimes receive even a bigger salary as to what they would, would, would receive having uh, normal, still working. Uh, when they retired, the salaries would not be uh, altered, so they would actually live in a very comfortable way. But the rest of the population would receive peanuts and would live in destitution. So he's trying to reform the, this uh, uh, regime, now the system. And there are so many people who are, you know, opposed to this because they are uh, they have been uh, the benefactors of the of the regime. Hearing like the actual intricacies of uh, corruption and and patronage, I mean that's abhorrent to well, you know socialists talk about equality, but that's uh, cronyism and something that we used to think was confined to just the Soviet Union. Well, not only that, but the Workers' Party regime, if I can put it like that, started with a series of very strange pheno phenomena uh, taking place, including the assassination of some undesirable politicians who could perhaps um, expose these uh, connections of the Workers' Party with very strange characters and very dangerous organizations. There was even the mayor of a city in Sao Paulo state who got assassinated as a result of this. And, uh, of course, there was a cover-up. And you cannot forget that the current president also almost lost his life as an, uh, an attempt to uh, kill him in order to perpetuate the status quo. Yes, that, are you referring to the one during the campaign when he was stabbed or another one? He was uh, miraculously saved by a very competent medical doctor, but uh, the um, uh, knife was just one millimeter away from his heart, and it was a miracle, or better say, his lungs. It, but everybody says that it was a miracle that he survived. Well, and now they are claiming that this person was men is mentally ill. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise, that's what they would do. I will not be surprised, I'm telling this to your listeners, if the person who attempted to kill the current president end up being assassinated in order to, um, uh, you know, uh, burn the files so that uh, the truth will not be um, uh, released. Now that does sound familiar to what sometimes happens in the West. Now, uh, Jeb Bolsonaro, his presidential campaign had the feel of a political outsider, but he was a career politician first elected to the federal Brazilian parliament post his military career in 1991, though throughout his career he'd been an outspoken nationalist and social conservative and a very anti-communist and anti-socialist. So he, he was a maverick uh, from the day he arrived. He was indeed, and it's a very important point, uh, the one that uh, you have just made. But we have to bear in mind that uh, uh, he has always been a colorful character because he has been more outspoken than any other uh, politician. Sometimes he uh, behaves like uh, very much in the style of the American president. And he is very um, um, unashamed of uh, making, making some very bold statements. But another thing that he does that's very important is to actually explain the context of the military regime. On one way, in a certain way, he, we could say that he saved democracy in Brazil. Because if the left-wing candidate had won this election, that would be the end of the country. I don't think Brazil could afford having four more years of that sort of corrupt, terribly oppressive left-wing government. So he saved the country from destruction. We would become like Brazilians would become like the Venezuelans or the people in Bolivia. It would be a terrible uh, reality that would probably destroy the economy of the country. Brazil is a, 
economically speaking, a powerhouse. And this would be spelling the, the death of the country. So he saved Brazil from destruction by becoming the president. We couldn't afford another four years of that uh, oppressive uh, socialist regime. But on the other hand, on the other hand, he is honest enough to say that we faced a similar reality in the 1960s, uh, when uh, the military were called by the middle class in Brazil to save the country from the communist threat that was very real. Uh, if it were not for the military, what we would have in Brazil would be similar as to what happened in Cuba. Uh, the communists had already taken the um, advantage of having connections with a very weak president that, that was ruling over Brazil. And he had employed in his government many communists who were actually conspiring 24 hours to turn the country into another communist country. And the military were called by the Brazilian society to save the country from these uh, people. But of course, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the military ended up doing things that I consider to be quite socialist. For instance, they left government with 500 state-owned companies. And uh, in many ways, to be a conservative in Brazil is not to be a liberal is to be a supporter of big government and nationalism. I think the good thing about um, the, the good thing about the Bolsonaro is that, and that's actually a miracle, that I'm very surprised by his uh, approach in this area, but he's promising a process of privatization of companies and reduction of the size of the state, because the state in Brazil is, remains very big and the more you have the presence of the state in whatever people do, the more you have the opportunities for corruption and a very high uh, taxation system. It's very hard to be a businessman in Brazil because the tax remain very, very the taxes remain very high in the country, and the only way that you can have a more a more open economy is to reduce the the size of the state and reduce the um, tax burden upon the citizens of that country. Yes, you don't need to tell me about the uh, the benefits of uh, economic uh, liberalization. But uh, as you said, the, the fact that he got elected, well, it shows that Brazil still has a degree of democracy and that the, the people were, were wanting change. Uh, now, most of the world came to came to new uh, Bolsonaro during the presidential campaign and all of the, the colorful things that uh, he said, I think he's, he's probably more outrageous, uh, the things he says than, than what Trump says. Obviously the comments that I wouldn't want a gay son or having a daughter would be a weakness. He said to a female politician, uh, I wouldn't uh, rape you. And then he's made comments about indigenous people and their will to, to, to reproduce. So it's way, way more <laughs> controversial than anything Trump's ever said. I'm not sure if sort of in Brazilian politics, you can sort of make that, uh, make sort of more outlandish statements, but when I, people... I think, I think it reflects the, the state of the nation in many ways, um, what was left behind. If you think about the United States, Trump is a controversial ca character, but America had prior to Trump not faced the sort of regime that Brazilians had to cope with for more than 20 years. So we, it's almost like to have a, a situation where things, people get more ups, getting more upset about what happened. And I think um, that reflects in the internal politics of the country and Trump Trump and Bolsonaro are good examples of the level of dissatisfaction with the political elites that were ru ruling the uh, running the show for such a long time. I think what uh, Trump and Bolsonaro do is to read the mood of the people. And they are actually seeing that people are very unhappy with the reality of things as they are. And they are, and sometimes end up making exaggerated comments, some must say. But what we have to bear in mind is that the worst person in terms of competence 
and abilities uh, in uh, Bolsonaro's government. Some people would claim it is Bolsonaro himself because Bolsonaro uh, adopts a very wise uh, policy, that is to employ people who are better than him. So one thing you have to bear in mind, similar to what uh, is happening in America, is that the minister, ministerial team of uh, Bolsonaro is highly competent and, and they are clearly doing an amazing job. So it, it doesn't really matter so much what Bolsonaro says, but what the government does. And as a matter of fact, the government is doing, so far, doing an outstanding job. And of course, this uh, uh, gives him the support of the people, because by liberalizing the economy and reestablishing the rule of law and law and order, that was a major issue in the country, because after all, the left always thinks that uh, criminals are the victims of the capitalist society when Brazil didn't even have such a thing. But uh, Bolsonaro is putting law and order. It's uh, reducing the size of the state, trying to reduce taxes and doing this reform in the um, pension system. So it's basically all the changes that are so necessary to bring about uh, equality before the law and freedoms in general to the people of Brazil. So I think in many ways the government that he had, the equip that the, the team that he has created or established surrounding him is doing a marvelous job uh, so far. But of course, it's just the beginning of his government. Uh, I might be changing my assessment in four years, but so far, so good. You make an important point there that obviously the, the electorate, they, they see politicians or candidates like Bolsonaro and Trump and their rhetoric refreshing. But the reason that they, they won is because there's meat on the bones. They've got substantial policies. And uh, as you mentioned, behind the scenes, the people that he's got as ministers and in the public service, they just quietly get on with the job while their opponents are just ranting in the, in the, in the media and getting offended all the time while the, while, while the real business is just getting on with. Absolutely. And uh, sometimes, of course, uh, in, uh, amongst these different texts and outrageous statements, he, get, he can get it quite right. For instance, what he did recently as to, you know, the remarks made by uh, the uh, French president, uh, Macron, and he, he, he was fantastic on that, and I couldn't agree more. Actually, I had to applaud him for his uh, comments. He was saying that Macron is unable to stop the fires in the cathedrals across France, and now he dares to try to teach lessons to the Brazilians about the fires in the Amazon that are actually pretty average. Uh, when they said the fires, the fires have increased dramatically, they used the last year as, as, the, as the comparison. But that is absolutely ridiculous because last year we have low, very low fire rates. Uh, but the average of fire rates, it's actually proving that this uh, year is uh, not, nothing, there is nothing extraordinary about the fires in the Amazon this year. Uh, even NASA has, uh, in its own report, confirmed that there is nothing extraordinary about what's happening in the Amazon. Yes, they've called Bo Bolsonaro uh, a fascist uh, since he, he ran for, for president, but now they're calling him an environmental criminal because they, they argue that his policies on the environment are uh, lessening uh, regulation, uh, wanting farmers to, to have more rights has led to these wildfires. And yeah, the mainstream media says they're, they're un uh, precedented and Macron was the one who described the the Amazon as the the lungs of the world and that it's 20% of the the world's oxygen and uh, I think Trudeau uh, jumped in as well to sort of say I agree the the the, the two sort of to, to use a more polite term beta males of the of the G uh, seven. Well, they, they were kind of implying that Brazil doesn't have sovereignty over uh, the Amazon rainforest that hinting that oh, we might have to take military action to secure the world's oxygen supply. That's, that's sort of what they seem to, <laughs> seem to sort of hint at. Yes, uh, but we have to bear in mind that the French are not like the English were in, during the colonization period. They were terrible colonizers 
And if you think about the worst countries in the world, they were countries colonized by the French. One thing that it seems that um, uh, Macron is not aware of the fact that Brazil is also very powerful, including militarily speaking. I don't think they would have a good time with us if they dare to do such a thing. They're not talking to a small country. And I think Macron should be worried about what's happening in his own country, that he seems to have no power or control over his own people. And they are now burning the churches and causing all sorts of destructions in France. France as a civilization has basically ceased to exist. The countries um, cannot teach us anything, the Brazilians. Actually, we should be teaching them because we have far more now decent environment, culture, and our forests are not destroyed as uh, in France, because um, you know that the forests in France have been devastated over the last years. So it's part of a joke for him to be saying such a thing. And certainly there is economic interest behind because Macron is a globalist and he's very, and he is also uh, one of these oligarchs controlling the European Union. And he is very upset that the Brazilians have uh, been able to, against his will and his wishes, to establish a um, free trade agreement with the European Union that will certainly undermine the French economy because the Brazilian economy in many aspects is, even with that socialism that we have, we had in the past, is uh, superior to the French economy in many, in many ways, many aspects. And he's very worried of this uh, free trade agreement uh, with uh, the European Union. And what he's trying to do is to use uh, this uh, so-called uh, this devastation and destruction of the Amazon as an excuse to block the free trade agreement that has been going on for such a long time. I mean, the negotiations and we it's just about to be implemented. And that's what uh, he's uh, doing these things. There are lots of uh, uh, hidden economic uh, reasons as to why he's behaving in such a way. He's not to be trusted. He is a very devious character and one of the worst presidents in the whole history of France. Macron, he seems to have achieved the, the unity of the French people, but just against his government, because you have the, the second and third generation immigrants, they already didn't like the French government, but now you have the, the white working class and the, the yellow vest. So yeah, Bolsonaro is, is exactly right that I'm not going to take any lessons from you. And uh, you also didn't mention the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, Bolsonaro has no interest in maintaining a Brazil in that arrangement. Yes, um, it's um, one of the ideas of the Brazilian government is to eventually leave this agreement. But it will depend on how things work. He originally was promising that this would be done immediately as soon as he became the president. Brazil has not uh, withdrawn yet from the um, Paris Agreement. But certainly, um, they are, especially the environmental minister, is an intelligent man, a very smart person, and he is concerned about real environmental issues and not fake environmental issues. Because, of course, he is aware of the great global warming swindle. So he, what he wants to do is to uh, stop with the fires in the forests. Brazil is about now to create another law uh, stopping the, for it, uh, the use of fire to clean um, the field in the farms. And certainly they also have 50% of all the forests environmentally entirely protected. You cannot touch these forests, which is uh, an area higher than the territory of that small country in Europe called France. So there are more uh, indigenous areas in Brazil than the whole territory of France. So this man is a hypocrite and he should be more concerned about preserving the buildings in France that are being destroyed by fire set by the uh, rioters in the, in, around Paris. So in the, it's just so hypocritical what's happening. 
Yeah, so in Bolsonaro, he's called out the, the fake news that the wildfires are unprecedented, and then the left accused the right of being conspiracy theorists, but there's these rumours going around that Bolsonaro's government started the, the fires themselves so they could create more farmlands. It's the opposite. First of all, these people are so deceptive in their um, arguments, or very stupid, because in the Amazon you cannot have farms. It's, the land doesn't allow this to, to happen. It's very hot and it's impossible if you deforestate, if you remove the trees, I must say, if there is a deforestation of the area, the, the soil will be, will be too poor to allow the development of agriculture. So basically only 20, no less than that, I would say eight, I think it's 8% of the area of the Amazon can serve for this purpose of agriculture. Uh, so most 92% of the area cannot be used for such a purpose. So it's really a, a, a lie. It's really very stupid to think that you can use the Amazon to have farm. Uh, when as a matter of fact, that area it, it doesn't allow for this sort of uh, human activity at all. There's been plenty of attempts at, at sabotage of Bolsonaro's agenda. I noticed uh, you commented on your, on your Facebook page, uh, it was a few months ago now, that his uh, presidential jet was found to have drugs on it. And, and that was a big story that, oh, that looks very suspicious. Yes, well, there, there are lots of um, things about this that are very suspicious because this guy uh, it was an employee working for the Brazilian government for many, many years. And guess, guess who employed him? The left-wing government. He was the pilot of Lula da Silva, that president who were uh, really connected with the um, uh, guerrilla movements and, and, and drug dealers. Even the main drug dealing uh, organization in Sao Paulo notoriously supports the left. Even the name of the main criminal organization in Rio de Janeiro is called the Red Command. And there is also the Red Falange. And these organizations, they are as much as guerrilla groups uh, for the purposes of uh, selling drugs in these uh, big cities in Brazil, but also with uh, a root in the left-wing movement when uh, those who were arrested by the military regime end up staying in jail together with common criminals. And they actually taught these co common criminals to use guerrilla tactics because they thought that they were somehow, by selling drugs to innocent people, serving the purposes of destroying the society and paving the way to a communist takeover in the long term. Well, the establishment, they're especially worried because well, Bolsonaro hasn't uh, been able to be controlled. He's in his first year as president, he's pretty much fulfilled all of his, his promises. One of the ones that I was most impressed with is uh, defunding uh, higher education uh, institutions that engaged in political activism and indoctrinated students and also getting rid of all of the, the cultural Marxism in the public uh, education system, which sort of, wow, I'd love uh, Scott Morrison to do that in, uh, in Australia. He's, I know that you're a devout Christian. He's promoted uh, Christianity as, as central to the Brazilian uh, way of life. And he's just gotten rid of all the sort of special interests boards and I'll, I'll make a comparison in Australia there's a there's a lot of uh, rights that are granted to indigenous elders to decide what to do with the nation's resources in Brazil uh, Bolsonaro has gotten rid of all that all that sort of privilege from uh, those self-appointed uh, people well he's uh, as I mentioned trying to reduce the size of the state and also uh, cutting costs, but it's not so extraordinary to cut the costs for education because the previous left-wing government spent so much money on themselves that they were the first to reduce the quality of education in Brazil. The former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, was proud to be ignorant. Uh, he actually used to say that he didn't have to work so much to become president. So why, why on earth you need to have a, 
uh, university degree. So he was the first to start with these cuts. Of course, what the Brazilian government is doing is to put conditions attached to this sort of grants because over the last 30 years, the universities in Brazil have been taken over by people who are even mentally not very um, developed, if I can say. They still are in the Jurassic period of communism. Some of them still believe in communistic ideas and, and they are actually quite um, stupid and but dangerous people. But these are the people who are uh, educating our children and the future generations. So what one of the things the left did, as they do here in Australia, but they did this very efficiently in Brazil, is to work very well uh, through the long march, the long, long march through the institutions. And they have um, populated the universities and, and schools with the most dreadful characters that you can possibly imagine. So it will take a long time to, for Brazil to be recovering. But a similar phenomenon that we are now seeing in Australia is also taking place in Brazil where people can now break through the power of the mainstream media and left-wing academics. They can have people like you and others who are able to provide more decent uh, information and they get to know more and better what's actually happening. Yes, he's certainly been the most impressive world leader in that regard because, or well, comparing him to Trump, uh, Trump uh, has been frustrated in a lot of his agenda, but uh, Bolsonaro has proved that it's it's doable. You can break break through the mainstream media's grip. You can upset uh, the the people who who think they control public uh, opinion. And even though he's uh, a nationalist, it's Brazil first. He's he's setting the example for all well, the rest of the Latin America and well, you should say the wider world that the socialism, the the welfare state as it is, it a nation can can change its its path. And, you know, I was in Brazil recently, Tim. I was a keynote speaker at one of the events there in Curitiba, a beautiful city in the south of the country. And I was absolutely amazed to see people on the streets demanding, demanding lower taxes, demanding equality before the law, and even finishing the gathering with the Lord's Prayer. But it was the most amazing thing I have ever seen in my life. To be frank with you, I wish that we could have the people in this country doing the same. Because I have never seen this in our country, here in Australia, people taking the streets to demand small government. It is the most beautiful thing I have ever witnessed in my life. And that gives me so much hope. What I believe that is happening in Brazil is no short then a great miracle. It sounds so lovely, and that, as you mentioned, like I'd love a uh, hundred thousand people to to march on the streets of Melbourne, uh, demanding lower taxes. That would be uh, fantastic. And yes, yes as, as I mentioned, Bolsonaro, he's he's been in power less than a year, but he's certainly made an impact. Uh, but obviously, the problems that have plagued uh, Brazil for, for decades, they're going to take a bit longer to, to fully heal. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, there's still people in the, the public service who are corrupt and, and going against him. There, yeah. There's still the, the crime problem, but Bolsonaro, one of his policies has been to reaffirm a uh, private gun ownership and uh, mm -hmm. obviously some of the some of the poverty as well and yes. uh, you mentioned equality before the law so that it is possible for people in the the lower to middle class to break into the the upper upper circle absolutely and, and that's an important point that this one that uh, we have made because he is fighting against corrupt elites not only in Brazil, but all over the world. So you have the globalist establishment, the status quo against him. And of course, people who have been uh, taking advantage at the expense of people's misery in, in Brazil, my beautiful native country, now they are going to do everything they can to destroy the government of Bolsonaro. 
because we have to bear in mind that Brazil being the seventh largest economy in the world, where is this all this money? This hmm. money are concentrated in a handful uh, people, number of people, who are actually taking advantage of a system that has been causing so much destruction and misery to so many people. But these people remain the government. These people uh, have a vested interests to destroy the Brazilian government. So the mainstream media, not only internationally speaking, but nationally speaking, will do everything they can to destroy this government. One of the reasons as to why they would be willing to do so in Brazil is because he also cut money for propaganda, government propaganda. So all these millions and millions of dollars that used to be sent to these uh, mainstream media also be cut off. He's doing an amazing job. We need to pray that uh, he's going to resist all this attack because the reason as to why he is being so vilified is all for the right reasons. Because he's de doing something that's quite heroic, quite brave, and in many ways quite miraculous. Yes, he's been unbreakable as president so far. Well, he's been, as I mentioned, in politics for, for nearly 30 years. He knows how the system works and therefore he can, he knows how to stay one step ahead. I've appreciated you today uh, coming on to give us a, a more insightful perspective uh, about what's going on in Brazil behind the, the sensationalist headlines and the outrageous uh, things that, uh, that he said. Having said that, I, I hope that you don't feel the, the need to migrate back to Brazil because we need you here in Australia to, to, to help fix uh, the, the problems that we've got here. Thank you very much, Thin. It's such an honor and a privilege to, to be talking to you. And I must say that I'm a great admirer of your work. Oh, thank you. It's it's always good to hear. And obviously another issue that you've been writing about is the uh, religious freedom debate. As we're recording today, the government's released their, their draft uh, bill. And I think you've made the, the, the point that we should be careful what we wish for because we might get the Sharia law Islamic Trojan horse. But uh, I'd like to have you back on again to maybe explore that in more detail now that we actually have a concrete proposal. All right, I wish you have to read the concrete proposal, but I'm not holding my breath. I am really worried about this whole thing. But we can have a chat about this another time. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. And that's the show for today. There has been even further political developments in the pro-Hong Kong democracy movement, so that will be the topic of our next show. Don't forget to catch up on the latest Detonation episodes, hosted by my colleague Steel Archer, is broadcast live on the Unshackled's YouTube channel, and the episode archive is now on its own dedicated YouTube channel. This episode is premiering on YouTube on a Thursday night, so for our live viewers, head over to the Uncuckables YouTube channel for the next live episode at 8.30pm Melbourne time, and check out the new show website at theuncuckables.com. Remember to counter the fake news and algorithm manipulations. Use duckduckgo.com for your search and infogalactic for your information needs. YouTube continues to censor and hide content from nationalist and conservative channels. Demonetization is not enough these days. So James Fox Hickens of The Rational Rise has launched rationalrise.tv, a self-hosted video site which features not only his content, but that of XYZ, Maddie's Modern Life, and The Uncuckables. So it'll be available if YouTube ever decides to, at a whim, uh, delete all of those channels. Don't forget, there is also free speech social media, which The Unshackled is on. We're on gab.com slash The Unshackled. We are on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. We are at mewe.com slash P slash The Unshackled. And we also have our growing Telegram channel on the popular encrypted messaging service at t.me slash The Unshackled. Remember that we cannot produce all the content that we do and bring you all the news that we do without uh, your support and of course the the best way of supporting our work is to uh, support us financially we're on patreon.com slash the unshackled we're also at paypal.me slash the unshackled we have our premium membership option on our website the unshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at the unshackled.net slash donate we're also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled and we also have our online store the unshackled.net slash store with our most popular merchandise. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.